uh, thank you for coming out on a wintry night like this. Um, I much appreciate it. I suppose there's one thing I can offer you a little bit in compensation for the weather. I hope you will find what I'm going to say a little bit more uplifting than watching the TV news. <laughs> <laughs> Which is setting a pretty low bar. <laughs> we imagine. But I'm, I'm trying to work, use you as guinea pigs in a way to work out um, some ideas that I've never really um, articulated and put together before. Um, and in preparing this talk, I've, I've changed my thinking sometimes quite a lot. I used to think, I used to be very clear that um, the way we lived, the way people lived in early 17th, early 18th century New England laid the foundations for the sort of society we have now. I'm beginning to think that was too optimistic. <laughs> and that in fact, the way people lived in the, the first settler, first period, the first settlers, the way they lived provided a much needed critique of the way that we live now. So I'm beginning to look more at criticism than continuity. And <clears throat> I want to start just before the Mayflower dropped its anchor. Um, <clears throat> on board were 102 passengers. Um, <clears throat> and it's probably worth reminding us that of those 102, only 44 were pilgrims. Uh, the majority, 58 of them, were what the pilgrims called strangers. <coughs> that is, people coming here as you, anybody goes to a new country to look for a new life. They were not religiously motivated. As we all know, the Mayflower was headed for Virginia. It was blown off course, the winds round Cape Cod, came round, uh, <clears throat> found a safe harbour. And the 58 strangers on board said, well, we contracted to go to Virginia. We're not there. So all our contracts uh, and the, um, you know, the, many of them were paid the, uh, in order to send back money to their sponsors. So all our contracts are invalid. We're going to do what we want. And the pilgrims thought, hmm, people doing what they want? That's not a very good idea. <laughs> so the night before they disembarked, they drew up the famous Mayflower Compact. Uh, I'd like to remind you of it. I'm sure you're all familiar, but uh, let's think of it again. Uh, we do, by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Not religion, a civil body politic. For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. Only once at the beginning was there a mention of God. And what, what I'd like us to think about from this is that um, this was essentially a community compact. It was people coming here to build a community in which they could, they could all fully participate. I want to contrast it with the people who went to Virginia at that time. Their aim was to get in and get out as quickly as possible with as much money as they could possibly make. The aim of the people on the Mayflower, both the strangers and particularly the pilgrims, 
was to come in, stay, settle, and build a community. Um, very different from the Virginia one. And I don't know if when I was reading you the uh, extract from the Mayflower Compact, if any of you thought of the uh, Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that followed it was about the rights of the individual. This is about the community. And one of the things I want to go back and forth between here is the constant interplay between community and individualism and how the balance between the two shifted as the first period moved through the 18th century and into the 19th. So this constant shifting along a, con a continuum between the community and the, and the individual was something that people experienced very much as they were living and struggling to set up a, a, a viable community here. So I want to start thinking about inside people's heads, how they thought. I want to start with two concepts. A concept that they knew as serviceableness and one that they knew as competence or competency. Serviceableness was the idea that um, everybody wanted to be of service to the community. They were not working or developing for themselves as individuals. They were working to be serviceable for the community. Cotton Mather in 1713 hoped that a young man may find acceptance with the people of God and be serviceable. For his own children, he had a mighty desire that they be useful in the world. In 1672, William Pynchon advised his son Joseph to be really serviceable to your generation and advantages to yourself. So service, serviceability then, uh, it sounds a bit of a mouthful, but it meant that the purpose of doing things had a very strong community accent, accent to it. It was not just doing things for ourselves. If it made the community stronger, it was worth doing. Don't you wish we had something <laughs> like that in, our, in between our ears now. <laughs> the other one is, oh sorry, one other point here is that one of the um, results of this idea of serviceable, serviceability, is that there was no real distinction, they didn't draw a distinction between work and leisure. There was no time of life when you retired. There are no 17th century golf courses, for instance. <laughs> Old age, in fact, was dreaded, feared, because it limited one's ability to be serviceable. Uh, Increase Mather said, wrote, how great will, be the, will the mercy be if I should be taken out of this world before decays of age render me useless. He prayed that my usefulness may in some measure continue as long as I do, and that he lamented in 1672 that circumstances and age made him unfit for service. Famous Samuel Sewell of Boston said that Ebenezer Cheever, he uh, was a headmaster of the school, in the first headmaster of the school here in Ipswich, and went on to found um, Boston Latin. Uh, so, uh, he worked, he kept working 
until 1729 when he was 94. And Sewell says, so that he has laboured in that calling, skillfully, diligently, constantly, religiously, 70 years. A rare instance of piety, health, strength, serviceableness. Sewell also wrote about a Solomon Stoddard, a minister at Northampton, for unparalleled constancy of serviceableness, because you continued your ministerial labours Yet now it is with much pain and you hardly expect to live out the winter. So you didn't stop work. You continued to be serviceable because that was part of your identity. Without being serviceable, you were not identified as a, a member of the community. So the idea of service and working for the community as well as yourself was deeply ingrained. Alongside it went the uh, notion of what, we, uh, what they call competency. Um, and that was the income or means by which you could afford to be serviceable. They talked in the period about two levels of income, subsistence and competence. Uh, <clears throat> subsistence was just being able to scratch enough together to keep yourself and your family going. Competency, however, was enough to uh, get what we might call today a middle, middle-class life. Enough to live on comfortably, to be secure, to feel secure, to feel, feel that your family was secure. But it was not the, it stopped short before the chasing after wealth. Um, <clears throat> Joel Stone in 1638 described his father's indefatigable labour and industry culminating in a competency in land. That was enough land to keep himself going, to keep the family going, not expanding to everything he could, he could get. The rest, uh, Matthew Biles of New London said he had the three grand essentials of human happiness, help, peace, and competence. In a study of the account books of early New England farmers, uh, uh, James Henretta said, there was no determined pursuit of profit. They invariably chose the security of diversified pr production rather than hire labour to produce more wheat for profit. Economic gain was important to these men and women, yet it was not their dominant value. It was subordinate to the yearly subsistence and the long-run financial security of the family unit. The farmers were there to produce competence enough to live on, not to make a profit. Let's contrast again with Virginia. I hope we don't have any Virginians here with them tonight. Uh, where the aim of the tobacco plantations was to make as much profit as quickly as possible uh, and, as I say, go home with it. Um, we'll see some of the effects of that upon housing in just a moment. So the aim was to secure a competence in... 1714, Daniel Allen wrote to his sister, uh, unmarried, I could be very well satisfied to hear you had a good husband with a competency to maintain you as you deserve. Um, <clears throat> William Williams of Lebanon, Connecticut, my fortune, said to the woman he was courting, my fortune is indeed small and may possibly ever remain so, but I hope I shall never want a competency. Um, 
So it's, the, the idea of a competence was deeply ingrained again. By the end of the century, by the end of the 18th century, uh, as we move into the 19th, we start to get signs of the pursuit of wealth. In 1772, uh, he, <clears throat> a, ma a man of judgment, he wrote, could lay the foundation of ease and affluence in life. Quite a change from competency to affluence. Joseph Clark in 1778 sought an abundance both of pleasure and profit in the pursuit of my career in business and commerce. Um, so the, the change to, to going for profit by the end of the 18th century is really a pretty significant interior change from um, the earlier. May, may I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I can think of people who were very wealthy at the turn of the, uh, from the 17th century to the 18th century. Um, do you know um, uh, Lewis, Lewis Morris of New York? No. Well, he, he uh, owned a lot of land. This is uh, late 1690s, early 1700s. And he was uh, very wealthy. He was able to travel back and forth to, uh, to, to London, uh, at that particular time, you had to have wealth in order to vote, and of course, people wanted to uh, to cast their vote. Uh, was then, then there was also the Delanceys of New York, uh, which were the merchant class, also around 1700, that were in pursuit of wealth. Maybe Boston was different. I'm not sure, but certainly yes, we'll, we 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 will come on to this. I'm um, certainly um, I'll get on to the housing in a moment. Um, certainly in Boston, by 1660, 1670, some uh, merchants there were building mansions of 11 or 12 rooms, which were ab absolutely unthinkable in a town like Ipswich. So yes, the signs were, were starting there. They were not found in the smaller country rural towns of New England, they were focused very much on the, the merchant class in the big, always coastal cities. Um, yeah. So the, the historian Lisa Wilson sums up this, I think, pretty nicely. She said, um, men looked for work that would provide at least an adequate subsistence. Competency, however, was the goal. The overt quest for wealth remained suspect throughout the small towns of the colonial period. So we've got some idea of the, some of the interior thoughts that people had in their heads. Let me change, slip over now to houses and see if we can see the connections. Um, in New England, in Ipswich in particular, the houses were all timber-framed houses. Um, we can contrast them with the, uh, what are called the earth-fast housing in Virginia. Uh, earth-fast housing is ones where the posts were driven straight, straight into the ground. Uh, there were no sills or stones under the sills with the consequence that the posts rotted, the houses didn't last, I think there's not a single earth-fast house, the only remains of them are the archaeological remains of the holes where the, where, where the posts rotted. Um, <clears throat> tobacco was a very greedy crop. Uh, it exhausted the ground in about three years. So the far because there was so much apparently limitless land, the farmers simply moved down the road to new ground. And the famous or infamous hovels of the Chesapeake Bay area in Virginia were left to rot. The earth fast houses didn't matter if they didn't last because the people didn't stay there. With the community emphasis in New England, 
in the new colonies, in Massachusetts in particular, houses were built to last because the community was built to last. So the timber frame house of Massachusetts has, has built into it uh, a sense of an established community. The other point to recognize here is that these early timber framed houses, our first period houses, are basically all the same. They, they, they all look very much alike. There's not a great deal of difference between them. Um, <clears throat> partly, this is because, and I'll get on to a closer example in a moment, partly it's because there were no architects. We only had house rights. House rights were artisans. They were artisans who were members of the community and worked within the community. An architect, if we had one, is an artist. He has skills that set him above the community, that stand out from the community. New England was built by artisans. There were very few artists or, and no architects. The standardized houses that these artisan house rights produced were very efficient. They were necessary. During the Great Migration, 1620 to 1640 roughly, between 15 and 20,000 people came to Massachusetts. That produced an enormous demand upon house rights to, to build for that, those sort of quantities. About half the immigrants were from East Anglia, the main source of the uh, Puritan dissenters in, in England. Uh, but the rest came from all over England. Uh, I read somewhere that they came from every county, uh, except for some reason, Westmoreland. No idea why Westmoreland should have missed that. Um, and it, <coughs> we can imagine that uh, settlers, most settlers, wanted a house that was similar to the one they'd left in England. But there was no way that was going to happen. No way that an artisan house right would copy a Yorkshire house for one family, then an East Anglian house for another family, then a... West Country, Devon House, no way. The artisan built according to the community norms and standards of which he was a part. It was also, uh, standardised housing was also efficient in another sense. When the house rights went out in the woods to cut their beams and posts for the houses, they looked for oak trees that could provide straight beams of about 16 to 18 feet long and posts or studs that were 7 or 8 feet high, maybe getting two posts out of one beam. These were the dimensions that worked for pretty well everybody. And if they happened to find trunks that produced 16 foot beams, rather than ones that produced 18-foot beams. Then the house that they were building was 32 feet long instead of 36 feet long. <laughs> 16 feet wide instead of 18 feet wide. Um, but it, it didn't matter. And it's been commented that the standardization of housing in New England met the cultural needs of settlers who came from many different parts of England, uh, quite, quite different regions, to come together and form a new community in which they related to everybody else because they lived in very much the same houses, the same standardisation of the housing, was a community builder. I've always been fascinated, a letter that I love, um, written in 1637 by uh, actually Deputy Governor of uh, the, the colony, Samuel Simmons, 
to John Winthrop about a house he wanted built on Ardula Road. Uh, he wrote, Concerning the frame of the house, I am, I am indifferent whether it be 30 or 35 foot long, 16 or 18 foot broad. I would have wood chimneys at each end, the frames of the chimneys to be stronger than ordinary, to bear a good heavy load of clay for security against fire. You may let the chimneys be all the breadth of the house, if you think good. It makes no great matter to me, though there be no partition on the first floor. If there be a partition, make one bigger than the other. For windows, let them not be over large in any room, and as few as conveniently may be, lest all have current, let all have current shutting drawer windows, having respect to both present and future use. However, the side bearers for the second story, being laden with corn, etc., notice the second story was not for sleeping, it was for storage. It was not a regular up upstairs as we think of them now. Uh, the side bearers for the second story being to be laden with corn, etc., must not be pinned on, but rather either let into the studs or borne up with false studs and so tenanted in at the ends. I leave it to you and the carpenters. In the story over the first, I would have a partition, but whether in the middest or over the partition under it, I leave it to you. In the garret, no partition, but let there be one or two lucum windows. Lucum were windows in the garret ends of the house, if two both on the same side. So I can see the house right, John Winthrop, reading bits of this letter and shaking his head. Wooden chimneys at each end of the house? Okay, you know, maybe that's a house that Simmons lived in in East Anglia, where end chimneys were, were standard. But I can see John Winthrop saying, no way, no. <laughs> I'm going to build one with a central brick chimney, because that's the way we do it here. <laughs> and he built a, we assume, he built a standard first period Ipswich house uh, in place of this rather odd idea. And we yeah, quite properly thought, well, dimensions, okay, we'll, it depends what we cut in the woods, how big the house is going to be, we'll think about the partitions when we put it in and so on. So Simmons uh, clearly recognised the, the wisdom of deferring to a house right. And this meant that uh, towns and villages in New England started to get a slightly different character, not a standard one, depending upon how the house rights and the local community interpreted this, the, this breadth of specifications that they uh, that they were used to working with. Uh, <clears throat> so art, artisanal architecture produces slightly various slight differences in various lo locales, but each locale has a very strong architectural identity within it. Uh, very much a, a community definition of, of architecture. In 1635, uh, Massachusetts ordered that all residents must settle within half a mile of the meeting house. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole story about you know, why that was and what happened. They had to repeal the law five years later in 1640, uh, because it was unenforceable, uh, people simply, if they didn't want to, they, they didn't obey it. 
Um, but interestingly, I suspect that here in Ipswich, uh, we maintained it, we kept it going. We, we have a very, you know, this is a local, very characteristic, unique to Ipswich set of artisanal architecture, particularly going up High Street, um, where the houses are very close together. The lots are very long and narrow, going right back. Uh, house after house is like this. It keeps them within half a mile of the meeting house. It produces, that many of them were built after that half mile law was repealed. And it's produced a very distinctive architectural uniqueness to Ipswich that no other first period town, to my knowledge, has in, in Massachusetts. It's a, I think it's a very fine example of how artisanal architecture can produce a community of, of housing, similarity of housing. Um, <clears throat> and yes, uh, they're building a community spirit in wood. So there were no mansions in Ipswich. Uh, in Boston, as I mentioned before, by 1660, there were mansions as big as 11, 12 rooms. In, Bos in Ipswich, five rooms. A <coughs> the hall, the kitchen was on the other side, the parlor. Above it, the hall chamber and above that, the parlour chamber. Um, according to um, Simmons' uh, wishes, where he wanted to specially strengthen studs for the uh, second floor, quite clear, he says, all the corn and storage up there. We've done a pretty good job with the Whipple House over there on the first floor, but the second floor should really be full of barrels and sacks and farm implements with a couple of mattresses laid out in between them for people to sleep if they could find room. <laughs> Setting it out as a bedroom, even an 18th century bedroom, um, is, is indicative of a taste that came a lot later of a taste and a way of living in a house. So the, the Ipswich first period houses were built for people who wanted to fit in, not for people who wanted to stand out. Samuel Simmons and all the settlers like him came here to fit together and house rights like John Winthrop could build the houses that enabled them to do precisely that. And these houses then were <coughs> houses where a family with a competence could easily afford. They were the right sort of houses when your aim was to secure a competence. They were not the sort of houses when your aim was to get as wealthy as possible, to make as, as much money as possible. And <clears throat> another aspect that comes together with the idea of competence of living a comfortable but not ostentatious life of living living in a way that is good for you and your family but also connects you with all the neighbors who are also living in a similar way uh, that is good for them and and their families we need to rethink the idea of a home. We've already seen that a house in first period 
was not a vehicle for individual expression. It was a, a vehicle for uh, community likeness, community sharing. Going alongside that is the idea that we need to think of first period houses and to going on to the second period too, being as far as possible centers of production, not centers of consumption. Our houses today are where consumption rules the roost. In first period, early Ipswich and early Massachusetts, the house was a center of production, productiveness. Um, I can go on a lot about this, but let me just give you one example uh, of how this plays out. We're, we're very fortunate in Ipswich in that we have the most uh, incredibly precise, complete town records. Um, I don't think there's another town that has the documentation of early life that, that, that we do. It's, it's terrific. All these records uh, were written in pen and ink on paper. Where did they get the pens and the inks? They made them at home. Uh, almost every house would have a recipe for ink. To make three pints of ink, take galls, oak galls and gum, which is gum Arabic, two ounces of each and three ounces of copperas. Crush the galls and soak them for three days. Then boil them in three quarts of rainwater or water from a still pond. When they have boiled enough and the water is almost half boiled away, i.e. no more than three pints are left, take it off the fire, add the copperas and gum and stir it until it is cold. Then put it in a cold, damp place. After three weeks, it spoils. So you make ink, you have to do it constantly, it only lasts three weeks. All period ink wells have screw tops. Many people today think that's because they were for travelling. It isn't. It's to make the, try and make the ink last four weeks instead of three weeks because it was such a hell of a job to make more. <laughs> the other misreading we often get today is that a, um, <clears throat> a lot of writing, ink writing from there, is fairly pale brown. And we think that it was black and has faded. No, exactly the opposite. Ink was tra almost transparent until it dried. It was difficult for the scribe often to see what he was writing. And it was a he, nine times out of ten. Um, so sometimes they added soot to the ink in order to see what they were actually writing. And the rather pale looking brown that we see on early manuscripts is the result of the ink darkening as far as that as his aged, not fading. Uh, as it, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, the pens they used were quill pens, uh, cut from feathers, probably two or three thousand years old, long history. Um, the quills came from usually geese uh, in the spring when the feathers were new and fresh. Uh, they took the five outer wing feathers from the left wing. The left wing was favored because the feathers curved away from a right-handed scribe. <laughs> Goose feathers were the most common. Swan feathers were for the really premium writing and scribes. Um, <clears throat> and for making fine lines, uh, crows, crow feathers were the best. Uh, and again, of course, we had, we had to have pen knives to constantly sharpen the inks there. 
So the household produced detail of things like pen and ink, which we would today we would simply go out and buy. We would be a consumer, not a producer. The big problem was paper. Paper making was beyond the household. Uh, it was long, laborious. It was all rag paper. There was no wood pulp paper till late in the 19th century. Uh, and a shortage of rags because um, people uh, reused bits of clothing and used and so there was a big problem with a shortage of rags. Uh, most paper, therefore, was imported. The, um, the first American paper mill was in uh, Pennsylvania in 1690. Um, the first one in Massachusetts in New England was about 1729, I think. Um, so it was a very laborious, messy process. So most paper was imported. Uh, it was expensive. And you will see, if you try to do any archival research, you need a very good pair of glasses because the writing is very small. There's no such thing as a margin. Every square inch of the paper is covered. They got as much writing onto the paper as they possibly could uh, because paper was expensive and imported. It could not be home produced. In a town like Ipswich, this meant that there were, there were no retail shops. You couldn't go shopping. Shopping was an activity that was inconceivable. Port cities like Boston, like Salem, Salem in particular relevant here for Ipswich, did have general retail stores uh, of imported goods that could not be produced in the home. So the ink needed gum Arabic and copperas. You had to go to somewhere, if you were in Ipswich, you had to go to Salem. To, to get your supplies of copperous gum Arabic. The, anything imported was in these very, very general stores in, in the port cities. But how did people, how did people get them? How did they, how did they pay for them? There was, as we know, there was a tremendous shortage of cash in early New England. There were actually four distinct ways of, of paying. Um, there was one called simply pay. If you pay for goods, that was the exchange of home produce, such as grain, pork, corn, eggs, at rates that were set by the government. That was known as paying. The government rates were unenforceable, merchants ignored them entirely, <laughs> and it became a sort of bartering system. But to pay for something, you used what you had produced in the home or the farm. Then there was pay as money. Pay as money was in Spanish royals, Spanish pieces of eight. Later on in the 17th century, Massachusetts shillings, pine tree shillings, and very few, very few people had the cash to pay as money. The third one was pay as hard money. And that was paying by English currency. Um, now, one of the problems with that was Oliver Cromwell beheading Charles I. Because in England, only the sovereign could issue currency. <laughs> 
So the civil war in England completely dried up the store, the flow of whatever currency or cash there was coming from England to, um, to New England. So paying hard currency, that is silver coins minted in England, was an extremely rare event. Uh, it happened hardly ever. And the fourth one was pay by trust. And that was simply terms agreeable to both the buyer and the seller. And in New England, particularly in the smaller towns like Ipswich, basically the only forms of payment were paying, which we should think of as barter, or paying in trust. And that was using home-produced items as your currency. It was not using official currency. To take an example, a, a knife uh, valued at sixpence, a sixpenny knife, if you paid for it in what we might think of almost as barter, uh, a sixpenny knife will cost 12 pence worth of home-produced products. In payers' money, that is in non-English silver currency, it would cost eight pence instead of 12. In paying hard money, it would cost the English, it would cost six pence. Paid by trust, it would cost whatever the two people agreed upon. Trust was, was very important. Very often it was, um, it involved futures. I will pay you so many barrels of corn when I get the harvest in, when I can do this. So um, <clears throat> paying in trust and being trustworthy was a um, was very high priority. Uh, if we look at the uh, court records, the court punishments, I'm going up <coughs> off the point a little bit here, uh, but a lot, a lot of punishment was uh, public shaming. It was destroying somebody's reputation. It was destroying their sense of trustworthiness. So they were put in the stocks for <coughs> public shaming. An adulterer had to wear a big red A for public shaming. In Salem, a man convicted of incest had to wear an eye. So, had to wear what? He had to wear an eye for incest. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so, punishing a, a man or a woman um, <clears throat> through public shaming had a very powerful effect upon their economy. They would find it extremely difficult to pay by trust. So they're, they're <clears throat> they'd basically be limited to what they had, could produce at home. Uh, <clears throat> the other, other point to make alongside here was that um, <clears throat> prison, early prison was used almost entirely to hold people before trial. Uh, very, very rarely was somebody sentenced to prison or jail. Uh, this is because, again, productivity and production was so important that you wouldn't take a productive pair of hands out of productivity for six months, a year, which would not do the community any good whatsoever. So it came to public shaming and whipping uh, were the two most common punishments there. Uh, fines were um, imposed, but with the shortage of cash, a fine could actually quite 
could be, actually be quite problematic. Ipswich tried to find Thomas Dennis, uh, and he had no cash, so they took a milk cow, which meant the town had to milk it every day. <laughs> Twice a day. <laughs> Uh, deal with the milk and so on or they would take uh, a pile of lumber which meant they had to store it so fines generally didn't work because they were extremely cumbersome <laughs> upon the town and, and the courts so most punishments were shaming in particular shaming or um, or some form of whipping um, A little story, Ben Hosmer from Concord had run out of rum, not a good thing to do. So he loaded his wife's eggs and butter onto the back of his mare and set out for Cambridge, which then was a port city and had, had shops and so on. It was a hot day. And he allowed his mare to take a drink from a brook, upon which she cooled off properly by rolling in the brook. <laughs> and he yelled, don't you know any better than to lie down in the brook with diners, butter and eggs on your condemned back? So he had to go home with no rum. But the currency that he was using, he was going to pay with household commodities to, to bring back the rum that he couldn't produce at home. So, again, in farming, I meant to go back to what I said earlier, um, there, was, there wasn't a determined pursuit of profit that would produce cash. What farming was meant to do was to produce what you needed and what the community needed so that you could make some surplus, but not turning it into cash, you could use that surplus to pay for things that you could not produce in the home. So the things that you bought from the merchants in the port, port cities were really home production converted into a commodity that could not be produced in the home. Uh, let me ask another question. So the port city uh, you can buy in trade for the merchants, but the merchants are buying the products, uh, a lot of them rum or whatever, from British ships that are coming in. How are they paying the British? Don't they want pounds and jones? <laughs> it's very complicated. There's a um, a story, well, no, an account of ships leaving Salem for the West Indies, carrying the most bizarre cargo, whatever the local merchants had taken in for payment, you know, in terms of local products, going to try and sell them in, in the West Indies. And again, um, <clears throat> a lot of international trade uh, was based on an elaborate system of trust. It was, I mean, venture capital, which is what a, a lot of it was, <laughs> is basically trust writ large. <laughs> um, because we are so used to thinking of all transactions in terms of currency, it's actually quite difficult to get our heads around a prosperous trading economy in which cash played a far smaller role than what we're used to thinking of. Uh, it was very much about, about products. Now, you, you mentioned the difference between Ipswich, uh, New England, and Virginia. Yes. Was that related to where the people who settled in those areas came from? Ipswich <coughs> coming mostly from 
Anglia, Suffolk, and Virginia coming mostly from London, a very urban area? I'm sure that had something to do with it. Um, but the, the main difference was that the, um, the Virginian, uh, the expeditions to Virginia, the ships were paid for basically by venture capitalists who wanted a quick return on their money and that people went out there to make as much money as they could in as short a time as they could, pay their debts and come back with considerable wealth for themselves. Um, so it was as much, uh, as much concerned with the motivation, and I agree with you, that that sort of motivation is far more likely to be found in London or Bristol than in a small town like Ipswich in Suffolk. <laughs> Um, and, and other East Anglian towns. But yes, the, it's hard to overestimate the difference between New England and Virginia in, in that period, in almost every aspect that, that, that we look at. Yeah. Marriage, that goes on in people's heads a lot. Love, marriage, privacy. Coming with marriage, the way people thought about a marriage, the Puritans found nothing in the Bible that said that marriage was a religious event or that God had anything to do with it whatsoever. For them, marriage was a secular, communal covenant. It was a civil affair performed by a magistrate, two people entering into a social compact. They informed the town clerk of their intent to get married, the town clerk would post notice of their intention to marry in the meeting house for three Sabbaths. Anybody in the community who thought there was a reason to object had those three Sabbaths to put up an, uh, an objection to it, uh, which could result in court proceedings. Um, in 1651, Thomas Salter, here in Ipswich, was fined five pounds because he professed to love Mary Smith and tried to marry her without the consent of her friends. <laughs> the community, parents, friends, neighbors, were the source of the social consent that was necessary for a marriage. Love did not come into it. It came, this consent came from, um, was granted by the public, and it came from a uh, publicly visible courtship that uh, a man would visit, would court a woman. It would be publicly known. People would start to assess their suitability and so on. And if she turned him down, which she had the right to, he was publicly humiliated. And a lot of men's letters uh, show the fear of being turned down by a woman and a reluctance to enter this, this public courting. So inevitably, there's a sort of contradiction between um, individual feelings, which we might call as love, and um, it's almost a form of serviceability. 
will this marriage benefit and suit the community as well as the people in it? Um, <clears throat> quote, often quoted, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man shall be alone. I will make an help meet for him. Help meet. Uh, somebody to share the, the work, the communal work with. Uh, <clears throat> in 1635, John Dav Davenport here, he comforted uh, a woman who'd just newly widowed, lost her husband, that she had been a helper meet for him. Yes, a quickener and encourager of him in that way, wherein you walk together. It was very much a partnership, like serviceability, like co aiming at competence, aiming at a good, stable life for the couple and for the community of, of which they were part. And what men looked for in wives there were good temper and a virtuous demeanor. Later on, by the end of the 18th century, we get uh, men writing about their, uh, their courting and their aims, where they want beauty, wealth, intelligence from their wives. Quite different from a good temper and a virtuous demeanor. Much more moving, much more to the, to the modern sense. And this goes along with the uh, Puritan, almost an anxiety or fear that secular love could replace or at least sort of um, become more powerful than love for God. Secular love was actively discouraged because it might interfere with the love that really mattered, which was the, the, the love of God. And <clears throat> this was love between man and wife, and even more, perhaps surprising to us, uh, love between parents and children. Um, about 20% of children died in the first year before they reach their first birth date. Uh, and as many as 40% died before reaching adulthood. So the good Puritan mother was supposed to wean herself from love for her children. She was discouraged from loving her children for practical reasons that they they might die very quickly or very soon um, and that she might mourn them on a personal level. When a child died, the child went to heaven, a much better place than earth. The mother should not feel a sense of loss, should not feel sorry. The mother should feel pleased that the child has gone to, to a, a better place. Really? Hmm? Really? Yeah. Here in Ipswich, our famous poetess, Anne Bradstreet, was very much aware of the, uh, the internal difficulties, tensions that, that this produced. Um, she was lucky. She had eight children. She survived all of them. Um, when about 25% of women, uh, sorry, 25 women in a thousand died in childbirth. So if you had eight children, that was 200,000 in, in a thousand, which, oh, I can't do the math, but quite a high percentage were going to die in child, in child. Anne Bradstreet had eight children, 
uh, and survived, uh, <coughs> and her children did well. But when her grandchild Elizabeth died at the age of one and a half, uh, she wrote, Blessed babe, why should I once bewail my fate, bewail thy fate, or sigh thy days so soon were terminate, since thou art settled in an everlasting state? Um, and you can see in those words the, the difficulty of um, giving up the child and tr trying to, uh, to come to terms with the idea that the child was settled in an everlasting state. And it was wrong for the grandmother to bewail thy fate. Uh, <clears throat> As one of her own due dates approached, Anne Bradstreet wrote, All things within this fading world hath end. Adversity doth still our joys attend. Ver the people in early Ipswich, as in early Massachusetts, were very much aware of death. Uh, death was on the doorstep all the time. And this um, directly uh, impacted their, their sense of love, that love was something you held back from. You gave it to God because he would never die. Uh, you would never be bereft. Uh, and yet, obviously, there was this, this internal tension between secular and religious love. The houses that we've been talking about, uh, usually four or five rooms, uh, crowded, uh, family, servants living in them, eight to 12 people in a four-roomed house, basically. Where did the children come from? Who had sex and how did they have sex in a house like this? There was no, there was no privacy. Uh, mattresses, which were actually called beds, um, were laid at night uh, amongst the barrels and sacks in the upper chambers, on the floor of the hall, in the kitchen, uh, in the parlour. Uh, <clears throat> no privacy there whatsoever. But there were attempts to, to gain some sense of privacy, and um, <clears throat> particularly in... The, Very much as today, actually. Once you've got some money, one of the first things you buy with it is privacy. And, of course, the master and mistress of the house um, <clears throat> went for a private bed. That is, a tester bed with curtains around it that created the only private room in the house. Uh, but, you know, we might think, well, that's easy for them to have kids when they've got a, pri a private room like this. Um, but there was a, an Abigail Willie of Oyster River, which is now Dur Durham in New Hampshire, uh, went to court because her husband was beating her. And she would stop her husband coming to her, as she said, when she didn't feel like it, by making her two children sleep in the middle of the bed. <laughs> so even within this bed, there were likely to have been four people, a husband, wife, and a couple of children. Um, I don't know when on the few occasions when um, she did want, allow him to come to her, but the kids on either side and the couple in the middle, or the kids on both sides, I don't know. Uh, but uh, sex was not seen as a matter of personal 
intimate, private. It was a way of producing community members. It was a natural bodily function. And it's only later that it developed the idea that it was an intensely private, intimate function. And again, in a society where the community is more important than the individual, this might seem a particularly difficult example for us to get our heads around, but you can see the pattern is, is, is repeated in it. Same with the idea of a three-holer toilet seat. It was, a, it was a natural function. Why make it intensely private and personal, as we have done? So, going back then, the sort of houses and communities that people lived in will reflect the ways of living inside their heads and inside their houses, were constantly interconnected, intercombined. Um, one of my favourite quotations is L.P. Hartley's, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. <laughs> <laughs> and... Thank you for listening to me while I've tried to gather my thoughts into the sense that uh, we started off with a very strong, almost overpowering sense that the community mattered most. We've ended up in a position where the individual matters most. I just want us to think about the balance, the interaction between that, and uh, perhaps to see that the way our, the first settlers lived here in Ipswich was not just laying the foundations for the rest of American history, it was also establishing a critique of the rest of American history. Thank you. I found it very interesting, this discussion about sense of community and sense of service in the 17th century. How, how much of that do you think into the 18th century because I always try to, uh, I've always wanted to try to understand how we ended up having so many great people in the 18th century that gave us the, the birth of America and Jefferson, Adams, you know, Washington and so on. Yeah. What made it different then? And some of the things you said about service and community, if it extended into that century, it may have embedded different values in, yeah. in people that also uh, enabled them to think on this broader scale and yes the um, <clears throat> well the first what we used to call the first period stretches well into the 18th century anyway certainly into the into the first quarter of it and yes I've uh, I may have oversimplified it but I tried to show there are um, Tensions, drives towards the individual that occurring even in the 17th. The balance starts to shift as you go through the 18th century. Um, <clears throat> and when the... When what you have to overcome is not a wilderness and a harsh climate, but what you have to overcome is more political, that is with people who are not members of your community, interfering in the sort of community you want to live in and the sort of community that you think will benefit 
Um, I think that um, goes along with the rise of of individualism. And, you know, there were great men in the uh, 17th century as well. I mean, people like Increase, Mathers, Samuel Sewell, uh, these, were, these were great thinkers. They were leaders as well. John Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it's never one thing or the other, but I think there's a gradual progression in which the balance shifts.